Okay, so uh, I'm actually surprised by how many of you didn't have enough aesthetics in these uh, days. Uh, so thanks for joining us again for the mini workshop. The first talk would be Enrico Terrone on imagining fictional worlds. And okay. the floor is thanks, yours. thanks, Neri. Thanks, Filippo, for organizing that. So I hope everybody has the end out uh, there on the and the tables. So I. Um, wanted to um, discuss the the statement that fictional invitation to imagine fictional worlds so i'm i'm, I'm assuming the view according to which fiction are invitation to imagine or suggest uh, prescription to imagine uh, some um, yes yeah, um, acts that uh, um, yeah invite or prescribe uh, uh, imagining from the audience but uh, I would like to, to 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 qualify the kind of imagination that is required by this uh, act of invitation or prescription, uh, because it seems that there are other invitations or prescription to imagine that are not fictions. So um, I I think the the the, the statement is it, it's good. It, it grasps something crucial to fiction, but it requires uh, qualification. And the way in which I would like to to to, to Qualify this claiming by arguing that fiction are invitation to imagine fictional worlds. But there is a problem there, and I think th this passage from from Greg Cardi is um, um, individuates the problem uh, quite effectively. So I quote: "The idea of fictional worlds or world of the story has the appeal of certain vague and comforting metaphors that disguise the gaps in our theorizing." So the, the aim of the paper is to try to, to, to articulate this notion of fictional world in a, well, in a way that can feel uh, rather than disguise uh, such gaps in, uh, in theorizing. So that's, that's the plan. So it seems to me that there is a sort of um, widespread the, 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 the sort of consensus view of what fictional worlds are among Philosophers of fiction, and that's the idea that fictional worlds uh, are um, somehow associated with clusters of propositions. So, in a sense, the the the, um, the account of fictional world is obtained from the account of possible worlds. Uh, mm, it's um, sure there are differences. And the uh, philosophers of fiction of, are, are very careful to stress this difference. In particular, possible worlds are taken to be complete and, and uh, consistent, while fictional worlds uh, are usually incomplete and maybe contradictory. But it seems that just as possible worlds can be characterized as, uh, as classes of propositions, so fictional worlds can, can be treated in a in a similar way. So um, this, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an approach that can be found in Walton's, in, in Katniss Stock, recent book, and in, in Manolo Garcia Carpintero, uh, recent papers. And it's a way in which is expressed uh, and summarized is this passage from Harvard, uh, who say that the fictional world embodied by a text is just the collection of fictional truths uh, embodied by, by it. So yeah, cluster, collection, uh, call as you prefer. The idea is that there are propositions and the fictional world is sort of the, 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 the totality of, of uh, these, these propositions. Well, my mm, point is that this is a theoretical account of fictional world that can explain something important about fictional world, but that's not enough if we want to mm, Capture fictional worlds uh, from the perspective of the of the audience who is mandated to imagine. So what what is imagine if fiction is is an invitation to imagine fictional worlds? What one is invited to imagine is not just a cluster of proposition. So it's, I would like to propose a sort of complementary view that supplement the, 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 the propositional conception with a, another conception that 
is meant to be more apt to capture the, the phenomenology of uh, the audience engagement with, uh, with fiction. Sure, one may say that um, propositions, um, are, can, there are different accounts of propositions, and if one conceives a proposition as a set of concrete situations or facts, uh, then this may be closer to, to what uh, um, a reader or a spectator is imagining. Because sure, if one takes proposition in the linguistic sense, that should people are not just imagining linguistic uh, statement, are imagining individuals, events, and so on. But if proposition are understood in this way, it seems that perhaps the account of, of, of fictional worlds as clusters of proposition has some uh, room for maneuver to, to, to accommodate also the, the, the phenomenology of um, the engagement with fiction. But um, it seems to me that even this conception that surely get closer to, 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 to the, this goal of uh, taking the phenomenology of um, engagement into account is not enough. Because the, 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 the point is that the, 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 the fictional world is not just a, a collection of facts, uh, but there is also a structure that the world imposes on these facts. And the, the collection, the mere collection is not enough to, to account for this structure. And that's not just the fictional world indeed. It's a, it's a structure that first of all is the structure of what the, the world is taken to be in, a, in the folks experience. So um, the strategy, the section three of, of the end out, uh, the strategy is to start from a, a, um, an account uh, of the, uh, our experience of the actual world. So what, the, what's the, the notion of world that is crucial uh, in, in the, in the non-philosophical experience of the world, in the, what we may call the folks experience of the world. And then try to, 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 to apply the same conception of world to um, our engagement with fiction. So move it from, from uh, experience uh, to say perceptual and more generally veridical experience to, to imaginative experience. So um, the um, sort of, a, of account, uh, this, well, this project of um, offering um, an effective characterization uh, of uh, the, the notion of world that is crucial to, to experience is a project uh, that uh, can be traced back to, to, to Kant's critique of full reason, but has been at least in the reading that is proposed by, by Peter Strawson. Is Strawson's idea of a descriptive metaphysics. What the descriptive metaphysics is a metaphysics that describes the people's conception of the world, what we, we take the world, the world to be. So this is what I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. And Evans develops some, some insights from Strawson. So it seems to me that the line Kant, Strauss, and Evans offer us uh, precious insights in, in this attempt to characterize the world uh, of our experience, the, notion, the concept of world that is crucial to, to people experience. And the, the, the key notion of world in this sense is the notion of uh, the world as a special temporal system. So I may just read these three, three quotes that I, I find um, very useful in, uh, in, in uh, clarifying this notion of world. So first Evans quote, uh, he says, Kant argued with tremendous force that it was not possible to have a conception of an objective world, a world whose states uh, and constituents are independent of one perception of them without conceiving of the world as partial, with oneself as located within it and tracing a continued path through it. Strawson says something similar. Kant's genius nowhere shows itself more clearly than in his identification of the possibility of distinguishing between a temporal order of subjective perceptions and an order and arrangement which object of those perceptions independently possess. A unified and enduring framework of relation between constituents of an objective world. And then um, in another passage of individuals, uh, this world is characterized, uh, as I said, as a special temporal system or framework. Uh, 
We can make it clear to each other what or which particular things our discourse is about because we can fit together each other's reports and stories into a single picture of the world. And the framework of that picture is a unitary spatial temporal framework of one temporal and three spatial dimensions. So that's what I call the Kantian conception of the world. And uh, the, the, in this, the philosophers I mentioned, Kant, um, Strauss, and Evans, they just focus on the, what we call the real world, the actual world, the, the world of our experience. But the same notion can be helpful also to understand what's notion of, uh, of world uh, is crucial to, to engagement with, um, with fiction. So a fictional world can be characterized in turn as a special temporal framework, uh, but this is a framework uh, that uh, is valid in the domain of the imagination. So it's an imaginary special temporal framework distinct from the framework in which we normally fit together uh, what Rosen calls uh, each other's reports and story. So it may be said that a fictional world is the framework in which we fit together the imagining that a, a certain fiction prescribes. So that's the idea. This, this concept of space and time, this notion of a special temporal system of framework is usually applied to, to, to organize and to impose a structure on the data of our experience. But we can apply the same concept uh, in a, say, a different instance of the same concept, so a different world which has the same structure and so it's of the same type as the, the, the real world, in order to, to, to organize uh, um, and make meaningful the data we get from, uh, from works of fiction, namely what work of fiction man mandate us to, to imagine. So um, is this uh, different from uh, the, the propositional conception? Yes, it is, but it's, it's not completely alternative to it. Uh, it's since that there is a sense in which, at least for literary fictions, the world is constituted by by a set of propositions, by by the proposition that the the the, the, the writer has has conceived, but. These are rather, the proposition can characterize the structure of the world. So the world considers say from the outside. But once the, the, the um, imaginative eng engagement with, uh, with fiction begins, then this the function that this proposition fulfills is rather to, to support uh, this imaginative activity in which the world uh, is this uh, uh, special temporal framework uh, that uh, the audience is, is mandated to, to imagine. And this can also help us to understand in which sense uh, fictional worlds are indeterminate and in which sense they are not. As clusters of propositions, so as, as creations uh, of um, artists, uh, writers, uh, playwriters, uh, filmmakers, fictional world are surely indeterminate because the, 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 uh, the fictional truths that an author can, can fix are just uh, in, a limited, in a limited numbers. But when uh, the, the, the audience engage with the fictional world and so start imagining the fictional world, the fictional world is usually not indeterminate. So, it's just that we use a, 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 um, a limited set of propositions and so that as such uh, leave the world indeterminate to imagine a world which is determinate. It's just so we, in the imaginative engagement, uh, the, 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 the metaphysical indetermination of the fictional world uh, is turned into a phenomenological uh, completeness of that world. So what, what happens in the, from the perspective of, 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 of the audience is that uh, works of fiction are just phenomenologically and epistemologically indeterminate in the way also the, the, the real world often is. So um, when we read a, a book of uh, history, say history of philosophy, we may wonder what's the, Aristotle's blue type, 
you know, it's not top, it's so interesting question, but if one can wonder that, it's hard to find a, an answer. So it's in this sense, uh, there is some indetermination in our engagement with, with, with the work of history. But uh, that's not, uh, sure, we are not thinking that the, our world is such that there is no factor of the matter about Aristotle's world, world type. It's that, that we, we don't know enough. The, 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 the sources of information we have do not give us information enough to, to settle this issue. And when we engage with, with works of fiction, it is usually the same. We take the, just, we, if we wonder uh, about uh, Sherlock Holmes' blood type, we just don't know because the, the, it's not written in the sources of information about that world we have. So we imagine this spatial temporal framework. We think that facts there are perfectly determinate, at least as much determinate as they are in our world, in our spatial temporal framework. But we, we just uh, rely on a source of information, which is the, 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 the novel or the film. And if something is not specified there, we have no other ways to, to know it. So that, that's the, 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 the account um, that I, I, I would like to propose. Yes. So um, taking this notion of, of uh, world of experience, especially temporal frameworks, and applying it to, to, to the activity of, of, of the imagination. A possible objection to, to that is that can be found in papers by, by Stacey Friend and Peter Kotatko, is that we don't really need this notion of fictional world. The notion of, of real world is enough to characterize our engagement with fiction. So friends say in reading, we take works of fiction, like work of no fiction, to, to be about the real world, even if they invite us to imagine the world to be different from it actually is. So it's not another world, it's just our world, uh, but different from how it actually is. And could have to say something similar, a test of narrative fiction directs our thought as well as our imagination and sensitivity to the actual world. And thus we can replace the popular claim that the author creates a new world, the fictional world of a novel, with a much less spectacular claim than the author invites invite us to imagine an alternative state of the world we live in. Well, the risk here perhaps is just, if, one mm, concern is that perhaps it's just a, a lexical disagreement and so not so interesting from a philosophical perspective. If it's, we want to call, uh, instead of fictional world, we want to call it uh, the world different from how it actually is or an alternative of state of the world, why not? It seems just perhaps more cumbersome. So fictional world as the... the the advantage that is a simpler expression. But um, well, if it's just different ways of, of naming the same thing, no, no philosophical disagreement there. But maybe that the disagreement is, is deeper in the sense that uh, what the, the friends and Kotatko and others that uh, uh, develop the same ideas mean is that we, uh, what we, uh, what, to build a fictional world in the imagination, uh, we import a lot of things from the real world. <clears throat> and so that's why that's not the, 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 the fictional world, another world, it's just the, the real world, because what we do when we imagine, uh, a fictional world is just to change things in the in the in our uh, representation of uh, of the actual world. But yeah, it's, again, it seems that the fact that that's that's true. Sure, that, that that's uh, hard to deny. It's something that philosophers of fiction tend to accept that the the the, the fictional world. Uh, requires um, a lot of uh, importation from, from the real world. So it would be hard to, 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 to imagine a, a fictional world without any knowledge of the, outer, of, of, of the actual world. Probably impossible. But the fact that something in, is obtained from something else doesn't mean that the, the, the second thing is just the first one. Uh, so just like 
to, 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 to use a, an analogy, I, I, I can uh, move to a, to a new flat. I, I can move all my furniture in the new flat, uh, but the new flat is not the, the, the old flat. It's a new one with the, the, the same furniture. And it seems to me that something similar happens with, with, the, with the, the, the fictional world and real world. So sure, we, we, we enrich this, uh, this special temporal framework, uh, which is the, 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 the fictional world, with many things that come from, from, from the actual world. But what makes this a fictional world and not just a version of the actual world is that it's, it's not the same framework. It's, uh, it's another, so it's an, it's not an object of the same type, but it's a different token of, 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 of the same type. So it has to be, to be considered different. So um, I, I use a, a quotation from a, a, a work in um, Fin Studies by, by Victor Perkins. He's writing about um, Orson Welles' masterpiece, Citizen Kane. Uh, and he's stressing this, this, both these uh, analogies and this uh, importation relation between the actual world and the fictional world, but also their, their crucial difference. Uh, so I, I quote is at the end of page two of the end out. Of course, this is our world. It shares our own economy, our technologies, our architecture, the legal system and social forms that we had complex phenomena like slum landlords, divorce scandals and fame. Its history is our history of wars and slums and the rise of mass media. Its notorious people, uh, IG, uh, IG uh, Adolf Hitler and these decisive events are the ones we know. But of course, its world is not ours. Cain is famous throughout that world, and we have never heard of him, nor of Jim, Jim Jeets, his political rival. So, yeah, then they, the, the, the two worlds, the actual world and the fictional world, share the same structure. They are both special temporal frameworks, uh, and they may share many contents of these two structures. Uh, but this is not enough to conflate them. Uh, there, there are two distinct tokens. One is the, an actual one, the other is a merely imaginary one of, 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 of the same type. So we have a type world, which is this notion of, 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 of a special, special temporal structure that includes individuals and events. And sure, that's not the, the tip, it's, it's, it's a peculiar concept because our concepts are usually, we make room for a, for a plurality of, of, of instances. So we have the concept of dog and there can be one dog there, one dog over there. While the concept of world is more complicated because we just have one uh, real instance of, of, of this concept. But this does not prevent us from uh, constructing imaginary instances, just like we can uh, imagine a flying dog. Uh, and so an instance of a dog which does not exist and yet it's an imaginary instance of the dog. So instantiate in a sense the, 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 the same type concept. And we can do the same with the, with the notion of world. And that's what, what uh, imagining a fictional world amounts, amounts to. So why why it's so important to 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 stress the difference between the the imaginary fictional world and the a, a real experience of the actual world? Well, mm, the fact that things in a world uh, are causally connected. So the the special temporal structure that the world imposes on its uh, individual and events uh, also involves that uh, there can be causal connection only between uh, things uh, that belong to the same special temporal structure. So um, we can, and this causal connection required, uh, since our con causal connection within a special temporal uh, system, uh, they require a special temporal root. So object uh, in our world, even object very far in, uh, in space, like the Andromeda galaxy or very, distant in time, like uh, ancient Babylon, uh, are st 
still part of our world because they belong, they have a place in our spatial temporal system and we can draw uh, a, a spatial temporal route that connect us to them. Perhaps it's a very long route, perhaps it's impossible, at least with, with uh, current uh, technological means to, 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 to really follow that route. But the fact, there is that route, uh, and that's, that, that's enough to, to consider these things uh, as, as um, elements of our, of our world. But fictional characters uh, are such that they do not have a, a special temporal route that connect us to, to them. So we, we can draw a, a special temporal route that connects us to the Andromeda galaxy. We can draw it that connects us to Babylon, but no route, uh, no special temporal route that connects us to, to Sherlock Holmes. That's why Sherlock Holmes belongs to a, to a, to a fictional world, uh, while uh, the Andromeda galaxy and Babylon um, belongs to our world. This is something that is, is nicely summarized in a in a passage of our paper on, on fictional world that Luik kindly suggested to me. It's a paper by, by Skolnik and, and Bloom, and they say, all real people belong to the same real world, and all of these people could potentially meet and interact in this world. This world is separate from anything fictional, so all real people are unable to meet or interact with fictional characters. Inter meet and interact are causal notions, but this causal notion in, in this account of wars uh, are grounded on a special temporal route. And so the, 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 the interaction requires a special temporal route, but the special temporal route re requires belonging to the same special temporal system. Fictional characters uh, belong to a different special temporal system, and that's why they cannot interact with us. So um, we, we, we can use the imagination to do that, and that's the use of the imagination that uh, I argue is crucial to the engagement with fiction. But there are other uses of the imagination. So we can also use the imagination uh, to, to, to represent uh, the, the actual world. So um, if once then I can imagine uh, how many candies or which kinds of candies uh, are in a box. That's uh, something which I think is is uh, is closer to what friends call uh, imagine the world from different from actually is or Kafka calls an alternative state of the world that we live in. That's why I think it's better to to not use these uh, these uh, expressions to characterize the fictional world because there are really cases which use the imagination to 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 represent our world. Uh, in a way which is different from uh, uh, how it is. So what, what's, what's the difference with respect to, to, to imagining fictional world case? Is that in this case, the, the primary focus of attention remains the actual world. We are just using the imagination to make conjectures on, 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 about it. So um, we, we, we um, do not need to locate things in a different spatial temporal framework. We are just... Um, considering the framework in which we ourselves are, are um, included, but um, we, we consider variant of it, uh, counterfactuals, uh, possibilities, uh, and that's also use of the imagination, uh, but not the kind of, of, of imagining that that's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's mandated by, by works of fiction. In, in the work, what is special in the engagement uh, 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 with fictions uh, is that we do not care so much uh, about our world anymore, and we consider a world that whose essential feature is precisely to be um, an alternative special temporal framework, and so to, to in a sense, to to to, to Break uh, our connection with with the actual world, while imagining as conjecturing uh, is is a way of imagining that keep us strictly connected to, to 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 the actual world. And this distinction between imagining in response to fiction and conjecturing, it's also helpful to 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 explain why fiction are not lies. And why fiction makers are not liars and cannot be criticized for 
or line. Since, sure, there is a sense in which we can say, yes, uh, fiction uh, offers us a, 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 an alternative spatial temporal framework in which Sherlock Holmes has a, has a place, while there is no place for Sherlock Holmes in our spatial temporal framework, at least not as a flesh and blood uh, individual. And also, like, if I if I say uh, there are um, ninety people in this room, uh, I, I, I'm may say I'm representing an alternative special temporal framework in which this room has as ninety people inside. So there is a sense in which the same model can be applied both to lies and to or to conjectures uh, and to and to, to fiction, but. Uh, in, um, in in fiction, uh, the, um, the focus uh, uh, of the imagination is precisely the alternative world. So there is no need to compare, uh, at least not in the in the um, in basic engagement. Uh, it's uh, the, the what is required to the um, imaginative activity is to consider and and pay attention mainly to the alternative special temporal frameworks. While uh, in um, in conjecturing or lying, uh, uh, the alternative spatial temporal framework is just a means to the end uh, of uh, thinking and reasoning uh, or getting information about uh, our own spatial temporal framework. Okay, last um, part of the talk is. Uh, on how this, this, this account of fictional world can help us to, to offer a, a taxonomy of um, cases of, of, of fiction in which this in which fictional worlds are, are more than uh, than one. So so far I've considered basic cases in which and the, uh, there is the the, the the actual world and the fictional world, the spe uh, our special temporal framework, and alternative special temporal frameworks in which fictional characters and events have their place. But what about cases in which there is not just one uh, uh, imaginary special te temporal framework, but two or three or four and more? So um, I think that using this notion of, of um of, of, of special temporal framework enable us to 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 to, to sketch at least a, a a taxonomy, and that's what I, I would like to do in, in the and I would like to use the, the whiteboard for that. So, the first case uh, is the case of of nested fictional world. So, sure, we, we have the actual world, and then there are there are prescription to imagine. Uh, and we uh, we use this prescription to imagine a, a fictional world. Let me call it uh, W star. But then we, we, within the fictional world, we may find other prescription to imagine another fictional world, W two stars. So an example is the the the. Uh, the story of the Grand Inquisitor in uh, Dostoevsky, the brother Karamazov. So there are two different systems. So the, the, and this inside system is causally disconnected from the fictional world, just as the fictional world is causally and special temporally disconnected from, from the actual world. So that's the case of, of nested fictional world. A different case is that of parallel fictional worlds. An example is uh, the movie Sliding Doors. In that case, the prescription to imagine these two worlds, uh, let's call them again U star, W star and W double star. The prescription to imagine, they both emanate from the actual world. So it's, they're not nested in the sense described before. It's just that we, the, the, the work of fiction requires us to imagine two distinct special temporal frameworks, not just one. Then there are other cases uh, that, that can be traced back to the categories of unreliable narration. Uh, for an example, maybe Nabokov's Pale Fire, James Turner's Crew, maybe another example. But I think in those cases, we don't need to have more than one fictional world. 
because in those, in those cases, what the the the, the uh, supplementary dimension is, is just epistemic. So we are uh, since the, the narrator is unreliable. Uh, we are meant to make conjectures about the fictional world, or we may perhaps be uh, um, subject to, we are perhaps um, invited to wonder whether the, the narrator is lying or is just uh, confused uh, or ignorant. Uh, and so, but in these cases, we are not um, meant to focus on a different spatial temporal framework. The relevant spatial temporal framework in which characters have their place is just one. The, the, what the fiction uh, asks us to do is rather to, 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 to consider uh, con conjecture, possibilities, uh, because the, 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 the information we have is, uh, is not enough. So there are um, mm, holes in the, uh, in the, in the narratives. Uh, and, and so we, we, we do not know enough even to, to, to fix the basic, uh, facts and events in the, in the story. So I think the, the, these cases are all often conflated in, in, in philosophy of fiction with cases of merged worlds and parallel worlds. But I, I think it's, it's, if we want to account for practices of, of fiction appreciation, it's worth to, to keeping them distinct from parallel worlds and, 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 and merged worlds. And, and I think the account of fictional worlds I'm proposing can do that effectively. So the third case is, is really not a case of multiplication of world. It's just a, the, let's call the unreliable narrator case. There is just one fictional world, W, but the, the, um, the, it's the information about the description we have of it are highly indeterminated. And so we are left to, to interpret it uh, in, uh, in two different ways, interpretation star and interpretation double star. The last case I, 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 I want to consider is the case of merged worlds. They can be obtained both from nested worlds. I'm out of the picture. No. Okay, great. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, or they can be obtained both from uh, merged worlds uh, or uh, from uh, parallel worlds. So it, 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 they merge because uh, um, some uh, special temporal route uh, uh, between them is drawn in the narrative. And so some causal connection between them become possible. So they, indeed, they are no longer nested or no longer parallel. They are just one world, but it's a world obtained in a very uh, peculiar, peculiar way. And there are there are fictions like this. So the case of merged world, uh, oh sorry, the case of nested worlds that are merged is the um, so-called Pirandellian uh, narratives or fictions in which characters start interacting with authors. Uh, and so we have a, a nested situation, but the nest, the nesting is such that at a certain point, the two worlds uh, have special temporal root and causal connections. And so it's, it's just, to, we go back to the case of one fictional world, but sure, with a very weird uh, metaphysical structure. And even parallel worlds can merge in this, in, 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 uh, in this way. There's a novel. Uh, that I have uh, discovered through Robin Lepotman's uh, book about uh, philosophy of time. And this spread always uh, October the 1st is too late, in which there are two special temporal systems, but a, there are certain points in which the two systems uh, enter into, into, into contact. So that's science fiction. But um, yeah, so the idea that merging can obtain both from uh, from nesting and from parallel, parallel worlds. But all these are quite exceptional cases. 
are modernist narrative or science fiction narratives or even popular narratives like, like sliding doors, but not so standard as for the, the narrative uh, construction. But there is another, another notion of, um, of the merging, which is why, why much more widespread. And, and, but it's also quite different from these uh, more basic cases of, of merging. Well, according to, to, to some philosophers of fiction, the, 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 the sort of merging I'm going to consider is pervasive, can be found in, in any work of fiction. And that's the merging between the, the, the two, between two worlds, uh, fictional worlds in a sense, but one of which is, uh, is anomalous. So one way of, of, of drawing this distinction uh, is Kendall Walters' distinction between the story world and the game world. So Walters' idea is that the, what we have so, so far called the fictional world, W, in the imaginative engagement with fiction is not a whole story. There is, there is a, a wider fictional world uh, the, 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 what you call the game world. So let's call this WG and WS story world, game world. The game world is wider because in the game world, there are not just uh, characters uh, and events uh, that constitute the fiction, Sherlock Holmes, Watson, and so on. There is also the, the viewer, indeed a fictional counterpart of the viewer, the viewer, the reader. So a fictional counterpart of, of the person who is engaging with fiction and possibly also a, a fictional counterpart uh, of the author who is providing information about the world of, of, of the story. So the, 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 uh, we, we discussed it uh, uh, the other days in the conference, this the tr traditional way in which the, these two subjects, uh, the provider of information and the recipient of information uh, are, uh, are called, uh, are usually the narrator and the narrative. These are fictional characters, but of a very special sort because they do not take part in the events, at least not the narrative, but the narrator sometimes, but the, as a narrator, it seems to have a different status uh, and to live in this sort of se secondary fictional world that is uh, around in a sense, but not in a spatial sense, the, 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 the basic fictional world. And that's another term that has been introduced in, in, in recent philosophy of fiction is periphery. The Stefano Predelli notion. So, uh, because Walton uh, game world is, is, is uh, the, the story world plus something else. The periphery is meant to capture this something else. So in this sense, the periphery is a, is a world of, of its own. The story world is a world of its own, but the two worlds merge, just like the, the Pirandellian worlds or, but they merge in a sense which is not exactly that of the, of, of the, uh, of the other one. Because it's a, it's a merging that does not involve uh, special temporal uh, connection, causal interaction. It just, it just uh, allows for flows of information. And so in this sense, it's a kind of merging that, that um, is much less striking uh, and uh, creative than those that we have seen, but can be perhaps a, um, a way of, uh, of distinguishing uh, fictional worlds uh, from uh, well from the real world and also for possible worlds because neither the real world nor the possible worlds have a periphery while fictional worlds seems to have this peculiarity of having uh, or at least uh, having the possibility of of a, of a periphery around them okay that's all thanks All right, so it falls to me to be the last talk of the coda to this whole week of philosophy overload on Friday afternoon. And I mean, if Derek said yesterday that if you're the last talk, you're allowed to, I mean, I think this is my chance to like just go crazy, right? So.
No, okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about fiction in relation to testimony. And so, as you can probably guess, this is going to be a talk about learning from fiction in many ways. And I take it that it's, a, it's useful to sort of begin with distinguishing very broadly between two ways in which people usually talk about learning from fiction. And I mean, one way into this is to sort of, I mean, consider a kind of minimal description or like an everyday phenomenon. So you might think that you can read a fictional story and the story in some sense makes you believe that P and P is actually true and your belief amounts to knowledge. And I mean, at least in that kind of very, very minimal sense, I think, you know, it would only be a kind of skeptic that would deny that you can learn something from fiction and which by which we mean, you know, that you can come to know things by engaging with fiction. OK, I, I'm just going to say, by the way, I'm only going to be talking about like linguistic fictions and I'm only talking about propositional knowledge. So, yeah. All right. But I mean, of course, describing things that way. Right. It's really just a way of raising the true at least two fundamental questions, right? Which is, on the one hand, one wants to know, right? How did the story make you believe that P? And on the other hand, in virtue of what does your belief amount to knowledge in such a case? I mean, those are, at least those are like the interesting questions one wants to ask if one wants to be more precise about what it would mean to acquire propositional knowledge uh, in an interesting way from uh, by engaging with fiction. Okay. All right. So I'm following Tamar Gendler here uh, in making this kind of distinction between two ways of learning from fiction. But there are many other people who basically make the same kind of distinction. But, you know, uh, I think uh, Tamar, she does it in a sort of nice way. And I'm sure, I mean, everyone here is probably familiar with this, right? So she distinguishes between, on the one hand, what she calls uh, narrative as clearinghouse which are cases in which I export things from the story that you, the storyteller, have intentionally and conscientiously imported, adding them to my stock in the way that I add knowledge gained by testimony. And the other she calls narrative as factory, which is where I export things from the story whose truth becomes apparent as a result of thinking about the story itself. These I add to my stock in the way that I add knowledge gained by modeling. All right, so I mean, so maybe it's helpful to just try to distinguish, to spell this out a little bit more uh, schematically. So I distinguish between clearinghouse and fact. I mean, by the way, the reason she uses these metaphors, right, because she's talking about exporting and importing. Right? So, you know, there's a factory and then there's a kind of clearinghouse, then there might be some kind of boat. Uh, I don't know. All right, anyway. So on the one hand, uh, this idea of clearinghouse, right, which is related to testimony, and that's, I'm going to talk much more about that, obviously. But the idea basically here, right, is something like this, right? The story includes one or more sentences that communicate that P. You come to believe that P on the basis of reading or hearing the story. And, you know, P is actually true and your belief amounts to knowledge. Whereas the other idea, the factual idea, right, is something more along the lines of the story makes you imagine or think about a situation or scenario or set of events or what have you. And by doing so, you come to believe that P, P is actually true and your belief mounts to knowledge. All right, so she gives some examples. I mean, the examples that show, you know, as examples of clearinghouse, she says, you know, I might learn how women wore their hair in 19th century France or when the serfs were emancipated or how far away a particular village is from London, things like that. And, uh, you know, as an example of the sort of factory style, she says, I might learn that the relation between loyalty and adultery is more complicated than I had suspected or that the deleterious effects of a rigid class structure are equally or unequally distributed among the classes, you know, things like that. And I mean, one thing I think is kind of uh, important to sort of point out is that I think this factory idea is really sort of an instance of a sort of broader view that other people have labeled uh, literary cognitivism, or sometimes I think it's also something called fictional cognitivism or something like that, right? Uh, but so Mitch Green, he calls it literary cognitivism, and this is basically taken from him, right? So this, the idea here is that 
Uh, literary fiction can be a source of knowledge in a way that depends crucially on its being fictional. So the idea is like in these kind of factory cases that you can learn things uh, by engaging with fiction in a way where like it was integral that that was a fiction that made you believe these things, right? Uh, but on the other hand, I think an interesting thing here, which maybe is, has been less discussed, is that the sort of clearinghouse idea really kind of suggests that you can learn from fiction in a way that doesn't really depend on its being fictional, right? I mean, this seems to suggest that you could learn from fiction in kind of the ordinary way that you learn things from testimony. And I mean, so, I mean, and that's the what, what I'm going to be discussing, but I just want to make a few more remarks about the distinction because I think it's useful to just put some, some stuff on the table. And I think like, first of all, it's useful to sort of notice that probably we have reasons to think that this distinction is really not a sharp one. So there are cases where we, I'm not, you know, they might be a both or neither, right? Um, so I, so here's a, an example, which I, I think is, is perhaps not so clear, right? So I take it that I can come to know that Thomas Cromwell's father's name was Walter from reading Wolf Hall, right? And so let's say I didn't know that Thomas Cromwell's father's name was Walter. I read Wolf Hall. I mean, it's pretty plausible to think that after I've read Wolf Hall, Wolf Hall, I know that Thomas Cromwell's, I mean, the actual Thomas Cromwell's father was, name was actually Walter, right? Okay. All right. But on the other hand, right, at least as far as I know, right, the novel doesn't really contain a sentence like, you know, Thomas Cromwell's father's name was Walter. And I don't, I mean, at least you can sort of imagine that the novel doesn't contain any particular sentences that communicate that Thomas Cromwell's uh, father's name was Walter, right? In the sense of presupposing that or convers uh, conversationally implicating that. Uh, I mean, at least sort of like you can imagine at least a, a version of Wolf Hall where really what's happening is that just like the novel uses the name Walter for Cromwell's father, right? So you, you read about this character and you realize, oh, you know, that's, that's his father, right? That's Thomas's father. And then you read on and then it becomes sort of clear to you that, oh, you know, this person is being called Walter, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe this is not the perfect example, but I, I think it's kind of a, a plausible example where it sort of, it might be unclear whether this is actually a kind of clearinghouse or factory style situation uh, of learning from fiction, right? And you might think actually the same could be said for, uh, I mean, it would depend on the actual case, right? But you could think about the case of learning about women's hairstyles. It's not clear that there is like a sentence in the, in, in the relevant novel that would like communicate women wore their hair like this, right? <laughs> so yeah, anyway. All right. So, but, it, but at any rate, I'm going to set aside the factory kind of idea. And that means I'm also setting aside uh, literary cognitivism. And so I'm really focusing on the sort of clearinghouse idea. And I mean, hopefully I will be looking only at clear cases, clear cases of clearinghouse, right? But I think, I mean, I think this is interesting, as I sort of said, because it's, a, there is a suggestion here in a way, right? That there is a kind of very ordinary way of learning from fiction, which is just an instance of the way that you learn from testimony more generally. And so I think, uh, you know, what we should be asking here is how testimony like is clearinghouse really? Of course, it might turn out, right? It might turn out, of course, that the way that you learn in these kinds of cases just is testimony learning. But it might also turn out that it's not the same as testimony learning, but it's interestingly testimony like, right? So it's, you know, in some sense, there are differences between the way that I might learn from testimony, if I ask, I don't know, Neri a question about like where some, I don't know, subway station is or something, right? But it might, so it might not be exactly the same, but it could be very, very analogous. Um, but I mean, I, what I'm going to try to argue, surprisingly, is that no, right? It's actually fundamentally different in interesting ways. All right. So I'm going to try to uh, motivate two claims uh, toward that. And the first of them has to do with the idea that fiction doesn't conclude, uh, sorry, doesn't include assertions. 
And the second has to do with a particular way in which fiction can be said to act as a defeater for beliefs that are acquired on the basis of fiction. And so, you know, I'll tell you what I'm, what that means. <laughs> but so, okay. And so I'm trying to divide this into two parts. And the first will be, you know, concerning the question of whether fiction includes testimony to begin with. And the second is whether, you know, instances of clearing house can be said to be testimony like in some interesting way. And I think, I, I think, I, I mean, we'll see later, also later, but I think, I mean, I also, I already kind of suggested that these are actually kind of distinct questions, right? Because it might be that even if the answer to question one is no, right? There's no testimony really in fiction. It could still be that, okay, fine, right? But, you know, it's still sufficiently analogous to testimony learning that, you know, it is kind of like, an ordinary way of learning that isn't really that special and so on, right? Okay, all right. Oh, sorry, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so let me say something more about uh, fiction and assertion. Um, okay, I mean, so the reason that this is relevant, right, is that, as people are probably aware, I mean, the sort of standard view has it that testimony, in the sense that we're talking, I mean, in the sense that we use that term when we're talking about the epistemology of testimony and learning from testimony and so on, the testimony is really just a species of assertion. So, you know, in order to give testimony in that case, you have to make an assertion or, I mean, what you do when you give testimony of the kind that I ask someone on the street, where is the I mean, university? And they tell me it's down there. What they're doing is making assertions at least, right? And so, so I, I call, I spell this out as the assertion view of testimony, right? Which is that you testify only if you assert, right? Okay. So, I mean, like many, many people have said, have, have views of that kind. And so, you know, given that, of course, it's kind of trivial, right? That fiction will include testimony only if it includes assertions, at least sort of like, you know, literally speaking, it includes testimony only if it includes assertion. Again, of course, it could still be that there's something testimony like going on and so on. I'll say more about that. Uh, but I'm going to try to argue, which uh, was already revealed during the workshop, right, that, the, that there are no assertions in fiction. Uh, and so, I mean, I have another paper in which I sort of go through uh, the sort of full dialectics of that. And I can't really do it all here, but I'm just going to tell you what I think like my main reasons are. And I'm completely aware that all the questions in the Q&A is going to be about that. And people are going to give me counterexamples, you know, so... Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so of course, I mean, as always, always, like some people agree with this and some people don't agree. So Neary uh, has a, a paper in uh, Phil Quarterly uh, where he also argues that fiction, do, I mean, for very similar reasons. And I mean, James Mann already had a paper in 2019 where he said that and so on and so on. But I mean, I would say, which is, uh, I think, I mean, the standard view probably is that fiction sometimes include assertions. So we're like, we're like a minority up here, but you know. Okay, so here's, here's the sort of style of the argument. So I think as Maria already sort of told you, I mean, I'm taking it that there are sort of two necessary conditions of assertion. And I'm not talking about necessary conditions as sort of like, you know, and partial analysis or anything like that. They're just supposed to be like results of making an assertion, if you like, right? I mean, you don't have to think of them as kind of like, yeah. At any rate, right? I think, it's, I take it that, you know, you make an assertion only if on the one hand, uh, so you assert the P only if on the one hand you say the P, and on the other hand, you're sort of precluded from a particular kind of deniability. And so we'll see what that's supposed to uh, mean. But just on the first condition first, the idea here is really the sort of very, I mean, uncontroversial idea that, for example, if I say this student has good handwriting, right, in order to conversationally implicate that the student is not a good student, I haven't asserted that the student is not a good student. And you can see that at least, right, because I didn't say that. Okay. But on the other hand, you might think, yeah, yeah, but that's already ruled out by A2, right? But I mean, there are other cases where you really need to impose this kind of saying condition. So, for example, if I say, my cat has fleas, right? And I thereby presuppose that I have a cat. I haven't asserted that I have a cat. I mean, that should be uncontroversial. Um, it's interesting, actually, to notice that A1 
at least if you read it literally, it's going to already rule out some uh, views on which uh, fiction includes assertion. I mean, some ways in which people have said that fiction does include assertion sometimes. So, for example, right, Ken Walton, he famously, as I think everyone here, everyone here is a Walton scholar, right? So, so you know, but he argued, of course, that fiction includes assertion in his book. And uh, he said, uh, for example, I mean, when he was doing that, I'm sure as people might remember anyway, I mean, he said that what fiction writers assert when they make assertions is usually not what their sentences explicitly express, not what they would be asserting if they use those sentences non-fictionally, which is just to deny A1, right? I mean, and the more, I mean, so what Walton was trying to do was motivate the idea that there are kind of, you know, for example, didactic fiction and these kinds of things where he said, you know, they're making uh, claims that we're supposed to believe and so on, right? So, you know, let's just have a very simplistic toy example. I mean, I'm not a Dickens scholar, right? But like, suppose you thought that, uh, uh, you know, one point of a Christmas carol is that uh, greed leads to unhappiness. Then on the sort of Walton view, right, you could think that the, I mean, the story, A Christmas Carol, can assert that greed leads to unhappiness, even if there is no sentence in the story that says that. Uh, I haven't checked. I'm pretty sure there isn't a sentence that actually says that, right? But anyway. but I think, like, it's not really that interesting to, like, battle with Walton over A1. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting is to think, like, why did he, why did he say that, right? And I think, I mean, I think what's going on here is that by, I mean, I, so I should thank Manolo uh, PC for, uh, for helping me out with this, right? But I think what's going on here is that by assertion, Walton really has something very broad in mind, right? He probably means something like Gricean speaker meaning, right? Or like non-natural meaning. I mean, and indeed he does say, I mean, he has, there is a sentence in Walton where it's, he says that you can make an assertion by honking the horn of your car. Or you can make an assertion by wearing a flower in your buttonhole and so on, right? I mean, and of course, as always, it's totally fine. If you want to use labels other ways, I mean, that's all fine, right? But I mean, I think it's another way of using the word that at least what I want to, uh, the way I would uh, use it. So, I mean, I think like what he has in mind is the, the Gricean category of, you know, you make some communicative act with the right reflexive intentions and so on. And he just calls all of that assertion, right? Um, so, but I think like if you, if that's the way you want to use the word assertion, fine. But I think that you should still acknowledge, right? That there is a narrower notion, which is relevant for many areas of theorizing. So, you know, in particular, uh, it's going to be relevant for theorizing about lying versus misleading. Uh, but interestingly, for our purposes, I take it that it's also going to be relevant for testimony, right? And I think like the people who subscribe to AVT, the assertion view of testimony, they're going to be interested in narrowing the notion in that way, right? I mean, the whole point of espousing something like the assertion view of testimony is to rule out things like making testimony by com conversationally implicating or honking the horn of your car and so on. So, I mean... A narrower notion of, of assertion than one that satisfies A1 is going to probably be the one that people have in mind here. And so, you know, you can look at, you know, for example, you, uh, there's a quote from Audi on the handout, right? He says, to give testimony that P, to attest to it in my terminology, is in an assertive as opposed to sarcastic or theatrical way to say that P. I mean, people like him, they have in mind a, the, a notion that satisfies A1, I take it. But I mean, at any rate, that's the one I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah. And so I might just, I mean, so I have one comment here about the factory thing again, but I think like arguably you might think that even so, right, if you can learn from didactic fiction, like uh, A Christmas Carol, you might think it's actually more like factory than clearinghouse anyway. So, you know, all right. Okay. Uh, okay, so the second condition, A2. So I hope like people have some idea why I, I want to endorse this A1, right? Okay. And if you want, again, like if you want to say that Andreas is really talking about assertion star, I'm happy with that. Okay, so A2 is this condition about deniability. 
And I think it's it's really important to be very, I mean, to be precise about what exactly does do we mean by deniability here. And so when I say that you lack deniability with respect to P, what I have in mind is that you cannot subsequently deny that you intended to convey that P is actually true. All right. And so, for example, right, conversational implica implicatures are going to be neither, well, I can't really say it, but they're not said and they're also deniable. Right. So in those cases, you know, they're like completely ruled out because neither A1 nor A2 is satisfied, right? Uh, but on the other hand, there are there are other things you can do with language where only one of them is uh, is satisfied, right? Or, well, only one of them is not satisfied, which is to show that that's why we need both. Okay, so for example, presuppositions, right? Presuppositions are not said, as I said before, like if I say this thing about my cat has fleas, but they're not deniable, right? I mean, if I say my cat has fleas, I cannot deny that I intended to convey that I have a cat, right? That's completely unintelligible. You can't say my cat has fleas, but I don't have a cat, right? <laughs> but you didn't say that you have a cat and that's why it's not, I mean, that's why uh, it's not an assertion. All right, but A2 also captures cases where you do say something, but it's nevertheless deniable. And this is the category that's most relevant here, right? So here's an example, right? Suppose that you're a stand-up comedian, and you're on stage and you say, so, you know, Obama went bungee jumping, right? And then later on, you know, a friend, like, you know, some kind of confused friend <laughs> asks you, uh, so uh, where did Obama go bungee jumping, right? And it's perfectly uh, fine for you to say something like five here. Oh, I didn't mean that Obama actually went bungee jumping. I was doing my act, right? You know, you misunderstood what was going on. It's totally fine. But of course, A1 is satisfied, right? You did say that Obama went bungee jumping in this sense, right? I mean, you didn't implicate that or presuppose it or like honk your horn, right? You said that Obama went bungee jumping, but you still have deniability. Uh, and so A2 here is going to predict that even though the comedian said that Obama went bungee jumping, she didn't assert that. All right. So the reason that all of this is uh, relevant for the present purposes is that, you know, fiction clearly contains many sentences that say things that are actually true, right? And so, you know, take the following example. So this is from uh, A.S. Byatt's novel, The Children's Book. So this is a novel about, uh, uh, you know, the arts and crafts movement and like early socialism and the Fabian society and things like that. And the, you read the following sentence in the novel. In 1884, the Fabian Society branched out of the Fellowship of the New Life, period. I mean, that's the sentence in the novel, right? Now, clearly, six is a sentence that is actually true. I mean, the Fabian Society did branch out of the Fellowship of the New Life in 1884. Um, and so I take it that something like six is the best candidate for an assertion within fiction given that this is a sentence that says something that's actually true. I'll say, I'll say also later on that there are, there are more reasons to think that that's a, a good candidate for an assertion. Anyway, but nevertheless, right? I mean, six is still deniable. This is what we were debating uh, in the Q&A of Maria's talk, right? So, or, or in Elisa's talk as well. Um, so, I mean, imagine that after the novel was published, new evidence comes to light showing that the Fabians actually broke out in 1890 rather than 1884. And, you know, then Bayard is like on TV and they ask her, uh, so, you know, do you think that your novel has taken a hit now in light of this new historical evidence concerning the Fabians? And I mean, in this case, right, she can clearly respond with something like, not really, no. I wasn't concerned with presenting what really happened historically, but rather with making things work for my story. And so this is, this is the point where it's very important to sort of address. Okay. I think also it was a sort of Manolo worry about is this just about possibility or what? Right. So just to make, say a little bit more about what exactly we're claiming when we say something like she can respond with eight. I mean, what's being argued here is, first of all, not that she would say that, right? And that also means that, of course, we're not arguing here that she actually wasn't concerned with historical accuracy. I mean, of course she was, right? Uh, 
But of course, we're not arguing here well, you know, about whether eight would be a sincere response, right? We're arguing about whether eight is a felicitous and intelligible response from a linguistic point of view. And the way to sort of the way to sort of get into this frame of mind, right, is to compare it with other cases. So, you know, if you compare uh, this case with a historian who writes that sentence six in her book on the Fabians, right, and then she is challenged with something like seven, you know, it's new evidence comes to light and uh, someone asks her, oh, you know, so are you going to revise your book now, right? I mean, for her to say something like eight is just completely out of the question, right? It's just almost unintelligible to say something like, Oh, you know, yeah, no, 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 I'm not doing that, right? Because I wasn't really interested in, in sort of giving you information about what actually happened, right? I was just trying to make things work for my plot, right? I mean, the only way to understand something like that is to sort of at, an attempt to, I mean, as I would say, change the force of the original utterance, right? So an attempt to sort of try to say, oh, I wasn't really writing history, right? So, uh, I mean... I think that the important thing here is, and I, I'm, I'm trying to pre, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to preempt the Q and A. You can ask whatever you want, right? But like, I mean, the, 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 the way to sort of think about this kind of theorizing is not like, could I imagine a situation in which, you know, but like to contrast it with these other kind of cases. And I think maybe I'll just borrow Enrico's thing about paradigm, paradigm cases, right? But anyway, we can talk more about it and we can talk more about it uh, later. But I, just to say, I mean, I, it also applies uh, to uh, statements within fiction that are not really concerned with, as it were, matters of fact in the way that six is, right? So you might consider uh, nine from Thackeray's Vanity Fair, which has also been discussed by uh, Kathleen Stock, right? So, you know, in the novel, Thackeray wrote, uh, when one man has been under very remarkable obligations to another with wh whom he subsequently quarrels, a common sense of decency, as it were, makes of the former a much severer enemy than a mere stranger would be. Now, I mean, okay, so we have to sort of imagine a, 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 another part, a fictional world here, right? Because, you know, he's not going to go on a talk show. But suppose he was challenged with something like 10, right? You say that someone who's been under considerable obligations to another typically becomes a stranger enemy given a later quarrel. What reason do you have to think so? And it, I mean, it's perfectly felicitous for Thackeray to say, something like 11, right? Modulo the English that Thackeray would have been speaking, right? So, but he could say, oh, I didn't mean that that's how things actually work. I mean, in fact, I think the opposite often happens. Uh, I was just, you know, it suited my purposes. And the reason, I mean, the way to sort of, I mean, massage your intuitions here is to think about other cases, right? So suppose you're a psychologist or something, right? And you write now nine in your treatise, on psychology, and then you're, you know, someone challenges you with 10 or something like 10 to say something like 11. It's again, it's, I mean, it's almost unintelligible, right? You cannot say, right? Oh, no, I don't mean that that's how things actually work. I mean, that was just something I said because it worked for that part of the thesis, right? It's just completely insane. All right. Okay. So conclusion. <laughs> All statements within fiction are deniable. Therefore, no statement within fiction is an assertion. Uh, and of course, all the statements in, in fiction that don't even say that P, they're already rolled out to begin with, right? Okay. So, I mean, if you like this assertion view of testimony, this just trivially means that no statement within fiction is testimony to begin with, right? It's not really in the business of making that kind of linguistic communication at all. And so, you know, that just means like in a, in some trivial sense, there is no learning from testimony in fiction, right? Because there's no fic, there's no testimony at all, right? But I mean, as I said, uh, that's not really the end, right? Because I mean, even if you like the ABT view, that's not really the end because it might still turn out, right? That instances of clearinghouse are still like in an interesting way, testimony-like. It's just that they're not exactly the same because, you know, people are not really making assertions. But you might still think that you could learn in a kind of testimony style, right? And even maybe even in a in a way that's interestingly contrasted with the factory kind of cases. So you know, there is still a sort of there's still room for being interested in learning in a testimony-like way from fiction, even if you like ABT and you agree with me that there are no assertions, right? Okay, 
All right. But of course, also like if you reject AVT, you can you can you can hope maybe for an even stronger conclusion, right? That no, 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 it's just the, the what went wrong here is that AVT is just not right to begin with. There are other ways of actually doing testimony. Okay, so um okay, so I, I just want to look at one view uh that rejects AVT. And I mean, I think so it's fair to say that this is really not a standard view, it's a kind of outlier view. Uh, but, and so I, I, I won't name any names, but I know some epistemologists of testimony who told me that you shouldn't really discuss that because no one really believes that anyway. But I mean, fair enough, right? But I mean, for our purposes, it's interesting to, to look at that kind of view because it's interesting to consider the idea that, you know, you might reject ABT if you are interested in learning from fiction in a testimony way. All right. So, you know, Jennifer Lackey, Sandy Goldberg, uh, they reject this uh, sort of AVT view. So they have a view on test of testimony where it's a much broader category. And so, you know, they don't want to restrict the idea of testimony to assertions, right? Okay. So I take one version here, which is the lackey style version. And she says, um, S testifies the P by making an act of communication A, if and only if, in part, in virtue of A's communicable content, one, S reasonably intends to convey the information that P or A is reasonably taken as conveying the information that P. All right. But I mean, if you just think about that for a moment, <laughs> this is a very broad view, right? But I mean, let's just take Anna Karenina, right? This really implies that for any sentence in Anna Karenina, such that either Tolstoy reasonably intended to convey that P in virtue of S's content, which means its meaning, or S is reasonably taken to convey the P, Tolstoy testified the P, right? But I mean, that's all the declarative sentences in the novel. I mean, pick any English, English version or Russian version declarative sentence in the novel. It's going to satisfy either uh, Roman numeral one or two, or actually both in like, maybe all the cases, or at least many of them, right? I mean, really what's going on here is just that, you know, what's being called testimony is just communication, really. Right? And I mean, it also imply, allows that implicatures and presuppositions can be testimony, right? And so ultimately, which is completely explicit in these theories as well, right, is that what's going on here is that they just want to say, well, there isn't really this special category of like testimony with a big T, Right? That's not really what's interesting to them. What's interesting is the question of how do you know something that someone communicated, as rhetorically or not, on the basis of that act of communication, right? as opposed to knowing something in some other way. Right? That's the interesting question for these views. And so the, the issue about, like, is this some kind of special connection to the speaker via testimony, with a big T, which entails assertion and so on, right? It's not really what they're after. All right. So uh, Lackey, right, she endorses uh, three necessary conditions. So she says, you know, you know that P on the basis of A's testimony, that P, which means for her this broad category, right? Only if, on the one hand, uh, A statement that P is reliable, or otherwise truth conducive. On the second hand, B comes to believe that P on the basis of the content of A statement that P and on the third hand, B has no undefeated defeaters for believing that P. Right. Okay. So I think you can see, right, that we're already really assuming here that at least this second condition is very often satisfied in instances of clearing house, right? I mean, I could come to believe that the Fabians broke out in 1884 on the basis of the content of six which is the same proposition, right? I mean, maybe I should just say, I mean, the reason that L2 um, is important here is because she wants to rule out cases where you come to believe something as a cause of someone's testimony. So like, suppose I, suppose someone calls me and wants to, I don't know, sell me a, a subscription, like a mobile phone subscription. And by listening to their voice, right? I come to realize that it's a woman who's calling. I can come to know that it's a woman who's calling, right? But that's not something I know by testimony, not even for them, right? Because that is not a belief that I formed on the basis of the content of what they said, right? That's a perceptual belief, 
And, you know, you want to say, okay, of course I could come to know that it was a woman who was calling uh, by listening to their voice. Uh, but that's not a way of knowing uh, based on someone's testimony. It's not testimonial knowledge. So that's that's the main reason why L2 is imposed, right? But of course, it's going to be satisfied in many of these cases, right? Um, and also, I mean, L2 is satisfied when I come to believe that P on the basis of reading a sentence in a fiction that presupposes that P, right? Because P presupposing that P is also something that's, uh, that uh, a sentence does in virtue of its content. And actually, even a conversational implicators are going to be satisfied, at least if you, if you read it in a particular way, right? Because when I realize that, uh, you know, when someone told me this student has good handwriting, that they're trying to communicate, that uh, it's not a good student, that's something I come to believe on the basis of the content of what they said, namely that he has good handwriting, right? Okay. All right. So that's okay. L2, fine. So we're on track to getting testimonial knowledge from fiction, right? But what about L1? So this, state, this thing about reliability. And that's actually really an important thing here. And I think, you know, people have already, I'm not sure it came up actually in this workshop, but I mean, I'm sure people are aware of this, that like people like Curry and Stock, right? They note that, well, many statements in fiction are not only true. They're like what they call non-accidentally true, right? And what they have in mind is that they, I mean, the way they spell it out is that there's a kind of counterfactual dependence on the facts. So uh, here's what Stock says, right? So had different events occurred, the content of the utterance would have been correspondingly different. And if the same events had occurred in otherwise different circumstances, the utterance would still have described them. I mean, you know, so like what's actually going on? <laughs> what's going on here, right? Is that this is just, really, really closely related to Lackey's notion of a reliable statement, which is spelled out in terms of sensitivity and safety. I mean, it's really just that, right? So, um, I mean, undeniably, right? By it did not just happen to write six and thereby accidentally say something actually true, right? She was guided by the historical evidence, Um and so, okay, maybe I can just spell out exactly what's going on in this kind of case, right? So, like, imagine, right, that the breakout took place in 1885, but everything else was the same, right? Clearly, in that case, she would have written 1885, right? Because her evidence would also have been correspondingly different, which means her utterance is sensitive, right? But imagine that, uh, in a, you know, she wrote 1884, and everything else was the same, except, you know, that Queen Victoria was, I don't know, two centimeters taller than she actually was, right? In that case, uh, sorry, imagine that, uh, imagine that they did break out in 1884, but Queen Victoria was two centimeters taller than then she would still have written 1884, right? Because in that case, you know, her evidence wouldn't have been different because Victoria's small difference in height is not relevant to the evidence, which is why her utterance is also safe. It just means, right, she was being reliable, right? She wasn't just making things up, right? So L1 is clearly also satisfied by many sentences within fiction. In fact, I think that's the reason, that's one more reason to think like things like six is really the best candidate for assertions, right? Um, so we have these, we have statements that definitely satisfy L1 and L2, things like six, right? Historical facts, or I mean, actual truths that are clearly said within a fictional text, right? And they're also not, uh, I mean, they're also non-accidentally true. Uh, but nevertheless, because they're deniable, they're not assertions, right? Okay, all right. So really what's uh, kind of we're left with here, which is uh, the sort of interesting condition here is the third one, right? The one about defeaters. And that's where I sort of want to suggest that there's actually a, a, a really interesting difference between the fictional case and the just ordinary case of testimony, even if you want to uh, endorse this broad view, right? Okay. All right. So what I wanted to sort of suggest was that, let's see, I can still make it. Okay. That fiction actually in, a, in itself is a kind of defeater. And so on a sort of intuitive level, what this means is that that P occurs within a fiction is a defeater for believing that P 
on the basis of that fiction. So in the end, right, you know, you could, you want to spell this out in more detail. Yada, yada, yada. Right? I mean, I mean, but I mean, here's, here's one way you might try to go about something like that. You might say, well, what's actually doing the defeating here is the kind of force with, with the, with, with which the utterance was made. So maybe you want to say something like if A makes a fictive utterance and B believes that P on the basis of the content of that utterance, uh, then the fact that the utterance was fictive is a defeater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to sort of keep it at the intuitive level because I think that's actually the best. Uh, the, I mean, it's kind of more interesting if you can make a case for the sort of broad idea first and then you can try to spell it out in a way. Okay, so... Just to say, I mean, what I mean by this idea that fiction is a kind of defeater, right, is really something like just reading that P in a fiction can never justify believing that P. And I mean, why would you think that? And I mean, it's one reason is to look at uh, the idea. Well, I mean, one motivation for this, right, is that many or perhaps even most statements in fiction are fabricated, right? They're made up. And so I have, I argued in another paper, which is like, I mean, so I argued for this very surprising and exciting conclusion <laughs> that if a statement is fabricated, it's not non-accidentally true, which means it's unreliable. I mean, it just means that if you make stuff up, you're not reliable, right? It's not really that surprising. Uh, okay, here's an illustration of that. So, Sue, suppose that Sue hates her boss and she wants to give Bob a bad impression of her. So, while Sue, in fact, believes that a boss would never do anything of this sort, she makes up the story that a boss moved funds illegally and she tells Bob this. Bob has no reason to think that Sue is lying. And so, as a result of her testimony, he comes to believe that a boss moved funds illegally. As it turns out, the story is true and she did move funds illegally, right? Okay. So, I mean, I'm hoping that everyone here agrees, right, that Bob does not end up knowing that Sue's boss moved funds legally in this case. Uh, even, of course, even though, of course, she does end up with a true belief that she did, right? But moreover, I mean, very few people would deny that he's justified in believing what Sue said in this case, right? I mean, Sue is just one of his colleagues and, you know, he has no reason to think that anything weird is going on here. So, you know, I mean, arguably, you know, he is justified in accepting her uh, testimony, right? And the reason for that probably is that, well, most assertions by one's colleagues are not fabricated, right? Uh, but on the other hand, since we know that, you know, many or at least, well, most or at least many statements in fiction are fabricated, the idea would be that the fact that something occurs within a fiction is actually a defeater. So, okay, so here, let's take uh, the example of six again, right? So suppose I'm reading a children's book and I come across the sentence six. Uh, so then I put in, you know, that the book is a novel. I'm actually not sure that this actually, I think, you know, let's come back to that if you like. I don't think it's necessary to put that in here in the description of the case, but uh, we can talk about that. I mean, it depends, actually. The reason I say that is because I realized later that that's going to depend on your view of what a defeater is to begin with. All right, anyway. So the point is, we already know, right, that six is not fabricated. It's non-accidentally true or reliable, if you like. But even so, if you think about it, if you have no other evidence, right, you're not justified in believing six. And also, what kind of evidence you need here is really kind of specific, right? It's just, you, it's not that any kind of evidence will do. What you need is something that exactly will defeat this default defeater. So for example, right, suppose you've also seen an interview with Byatt where she says that she wanted the book to include historical information readers could learn from. That still really doesn't justify you in believing six because you would also need grounds for taking six to be one of these historical truths. And you might think like this is obvious, but that's because you already have evidence about the Fabians, right? So, I mean, to have grounds for the idea that six is one of these historical truths is precisely to have more evidence than just six, right? So 
you would need to see, I mean, the, the way it usually works is something like I read something like six and then, oh, you know, I have this other stuff that I know or, or have other evidence that I have about the Fabians. That's the reason why I just immediately defeat this default fiction defeater. But the, the default fiction defeater is there and needs to be defeated every time, right? Uh, okay. So given the broad view of testimony, which is this lackey view L1 through L3, well, uh, yeah. So the broad view of testimony, no, it doesn't have to be an assertion. And then the, the corresponding view of learning, right? L1 through L3. Of course, it's still true that you could come to know six, as she would say, on the basis of by its testimony, right? It might be that L1, L2, and L3 are satisfied. You might have a defeater for this fiction defeater. Um, and so, you know, for her, that really just means you could learn six on the basis of bias communicating six to you, right? But given L3, it only really works if you can defeat this default defeater. And I mean, that's unlike ordinary testimony, regardless of whatever else you think, right? So, you know, even for proponents of the broad view, uh, the fact that the fact that someone communicated the P to you in ordinary non-fictional discourse is not a defeater, right? There are, you can have many defeaters in many cases, right? Like I don't trust Neri. I don't know. I mean, I, uh, he's he's drunk, right? Or he just moved here. All these things can be defeaters, right? Which means I'm not justified in accepting what he tells me. But the very fact that he said it, right, is not a defeater. All right. So, um, I mean, yeah. So, for example, even in the slander case where, I mean, what she says is unreliable and so on, right? The mere fact that she told Bob what she did is not a defeater for Bob. There might be other things that are defeaters for Bob but not the mere fact that she made that utterance. Okay, uh, so just to sort of uh, conclude, I mean, if you accept the assertion view, uh, then as we, as we know, right, like, and also if you, I mean, and you agree with me that there are no assertions in fiction, we already know that instances of clearinghouse are not instances of testimonial knowledge. Uh, so, but you might think that, um, so, uh, even if you agree with both of those and you also agree that, okay, yes, strictly speaking, there are no instances of test, uh, testimonial knowledge, there could still be an interesting uh, parallel with learning from testimony. Uh, but, um, but so, but no, right? Because of this default defeater. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so if you accept the broad view, um, Instances of clearinghouse are still unlike ordinary instances of testimonial knowledge due to this default defeater. So that was a little bit, uh, garb. you see what I mean, right? Like either way, it's going to be different because of that default defeater. And I mean, okay, so, and even if you accept the assertion view and you don't agree with me that there are no assertions in fiction, you should still agree that there is this special defeater status. And so you should still agree that it's, it's interestingly different from ordinary uh, learning from testimony in the sense that you, you're going to need more evidence. Okay, so uh, instances of clearinghouse are fundamentally different from ordinary cases of learning from testimony. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>